and we've climbed up above the village of Braemar in the Scottish Highlands. We're at about 1300 feet and it seemed a good place to join the conversation that's already gearing up around the country on what sort of winter we might have in store. So why are we here? Well, as well as being incredibly blustery, Braemar holds the record for the lowest temperature ever recorded in the UK, a brassic minus 27.2 degrees Celsius. So where better to kick off as we ask, are we in for another big freeze? We'll be out and about looking at the latest science and cutting edge weather forecasting. But what about our airports, our supermarkets, our farmers, our energy suppliers and health service? Do they think that they've got another hard winter coming and most importantly, are they prepared for it? But over the next hour, what we seek to answer is really just one simple question. Will it snow? Remember this? Motorists gridlocked on icy roads, trains stranded and thousands of flights cancelled. Across the UK, we did battle with the wrong type of snow, killer ice and an estimated cost to the economy of over £200 million per day in transport disruption alone. December was the coldest month for over a century. With the mild weather across the UK today, it's hard to cast our minds back to just nine months ago when we emerged from what journalists dubbed Snowmageddon. Look at that! The very first snow of the British winter. I knew we'd come to the right place and we've come to the right man. This is Alex Hill. He has been at the front line of Scottish meteorology for how many years, Alex? Uh, 37. Wow. When you see snow like that, mm -hmm. is this a sign that winter is well and truly on its way? Is this the first snow of the year? First snow was a few weeks back. Uh -huh. It's all gone now, of course, apart from looking back to we saw up there. Uh, but we had a cold northerly for a while, so we got some very heavy showers, and that plonks a, a few centimetres of snow in quite a few places. What are we going to see in the next in the next month? Well, the way things are looking at the moment, certainly for the next week to ten days, the chances of seeing any significant snow are actually very, very small. But in your 37 years of experience, had you seen winters like the ones that we've had the last couple of years? I think that's the curiosity. Everybody got into a, a kind of paddy about it. And yes, I think the, the 10 11 was a particularly chilly winter. Yeah. But it lasted, if you remember, just for November and December. By the time you get into January and February, the temperatures are getting milder and milder and milder. Has it been an exciting time for a meteorologist? <laughs> Exciting, certainly, yes, and stressful, certainly, um, but it makes people realise perhaps that weather has much more impact than you imagine on your day-to-day -day life. The Met Office has one of its 450 weather stations up here at Braemar, and they know from bitter experience it's not too early to be on snow alert. So what has been making our winters so unseasonably cold recently? Can we blame a particular type of weather system? Can scientists predict how much snow is going to fall? And what about the forecasters? Can we rely on them to see another big freeze heading our way? I have to say... It is quite a relief to sit down. We have been tearing around the country for the last week, trying to establish whether we have got another truly horrible winter heading our way. And, and it does seem a little bit ridiculous because we're just emerging from the warmest October on record. We're now at the BBC headquarters in Glasgow. Glasgow, and look, we've got an open roof above us. And it's not exactly sunny, but it's actually quite warm. So do you think we're all getting into a bit of a panic about nothing? Well, it is unseasonably warm, but this is a conversation that we do love to have in the UK, and I think it's a scientific question. The headlines have already started. Here's one from one newspaper, Britain faces an early big freeze. Now, I think science should be able to answer that question already 
Earlier this week in the US, there was a monster snowfall and we did see the type of chaos that we saw last year with airports being closed down. People are even saying, could we be entering a mini ice age? So the thing is, we have got all this technology at our fingertips. There are satellites in the sky. We've got data pouring in. Surely science should be able to tell us whether or not it's going to snow. Climate science is an enormous field, and you're, you're right, there is a bewildering amount of data out there. But what I want to find out is what are the limits of that science? How much can the data actually tell us about what the weather is going to do in the next few weeks? Well, let's also not forget that there was a time when we didn't have satellites. We didn't have all this technology at our fingertips. Can the natural world actually give us any sort of clue as to what sort of winter we're going to have? Well, later in the program, Alice Fowler is going to be investigating that for us. She's heading out into the countryside to see what the natural world might or might not be able to tell us about the coming winter. But our investigation started right at the front line of meteorology down south. Britain's weather is volatile and ever-changing and we are famously obsessed with it. The people who do daily battle with our unpredictable weather and indeed with our expectations work here at the Met Office headquarters. The Met Office works around the clock, 365 days a year, providing forecast data for over 300 locations in the UK. But predicting the weather is a tricky business, involving supercomputers, expert meteorologists and data collected from all over the planet, including the deep ocean and outer space. If you've got all these thousands and thousands of observations coming in, you've got all these computers and computer models doing all this work and all these specialists here, why is it so difficult to get a forecast absolutely accurate? Well, it is difficult, but we have successes as well. You've got to remember last winter, the snow forecast in the short period were excellently forecast. Mm -hmm. We had the Heathrow forecast of snow and all the rest of it. We, we do do well, but yes, of course, there are some difficulties in forecasting the weather. As we head into winter, there's a lot at stake. Farmers risk loss of livestock. Local authorities need to know when to grit the roads. And any of us wanting to travel are desperate to know what's in store. But the truth is, predicting the weather day by day is still the only way to promise accuracy. So this model is um, created by your supercomputer from all those millions of observations that are coming in from around the globe. That's absolutely right, and it shows a band of rain coming in across Ireland. Mm -hmm. Now, when the forecasters, the chief forecaster, one of his jobs is to check out the reliability of that forecast. And as you can see here, we're about the same time. This is actual rainfall over Ireland. So the front coming in from the west, the model prediction, and the actual position of the rain on the radar is actually fairly good. So we know categorically what's happening now. How about what's going to happen tomorrow? How do you then use that Abs information? Absolutely right. But we've got to know what's happening now, whether the model's exactly correct before we can make a prediction. Once we know what's happening now through the observations, through the models and looking at everything, we can then make a, a much more confident statement about what will happen tomorrow. Over the coming weeks, what will you be looking for to tell you that it is going to snow? One of the most important things is to look at the temperature of the air mass. And in fact, it's not just the, believe it or not, it's not just the temperature of the air mass, it's the dryness. Because as that rain falls into very dry air, it actually cools the air by a thing called evaporative cooling. These are two very important factors as to whether that will be rain or be turned to snow. Despite a supercomputer that can perform more than a billion calculations per second, predicting whether it will snow even as far ahead as this coming week is pushing the limits of what they can say with confidence. At this point, could you say, hand on heart, whether it's going to snow or not this winter? Well, it's going to snow somewhere on the British Isles this winter, but anyone who turns around and says on the 25th of December, which happens to be Christmas Day, mm. it will snow, is quite frankly a fool. The Met Office does look further ahead. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Now we're going to
Adam Scaife leads a team that looks both at seasonal prediction and how climate on a long-term and global scale affects the weather we experience in the UK. Why is it so hard to make an accurate long-range forecast? So the fundamental reason is that we live in the mid-latitudes where the storm track is, there are lots of storms, lots of variability. I guess this is part of the reason that British people are so obsessed with the weather, um, while they also like to criticise weather forecasters as well sometimes. Why is it very difficult for you to nail your flags to the mast and say, it will snow in February? Um, because basically atmospheric chaos is a real phenomenon. When, when, when the old adage that the butterfly flaps its wings in Brazil sets off a storm somewhere across the world, that really does happen. A small perturbation today can change the, the detailed outcome in the future. So you can't nail your flag to the mast, as you say, and be, be deterministic and be specific. Most people know that Britain is warmer than it should be for its latitude, and that's thanks to two things. The first is thermohaline circulation, or THC, a massive movement of water in the oceans around the world. But some people have raised concerns that the melting of the northern ice cap could affect the THC and maybe even shut it down, and this would make our weather significantly colder. Research continues. But the second and best understood governor of our winter weather here in Britain is, of course, the jet stream, which feeds us with warm, moist air from the west. But it's an unpredictable beast and sometimes gets knocked off course. Just a single air current shifting down from, say, Siberia can be enough to disrupt the jet stream's warming influence. Meteorologists call this a blocking pattern, and such a weather system was responsible for last year's big freeze. It's clear, even with thousands of bits of data coming in every day from every corner of the globe, it's really difficult to forecast when snow might fall here in the UK. But before they can worry about predicting when snow will fall, scientists have to understand how it is made. The big question for me is what triggers a huge snowfall? We know that snow is made inside clouds, just like rain. But snow is not simply frozen rain. So what is it then? I'm hoping that the Centre for Atmospheric Science here at the University of Manchester will have some answers for me. The biggest problem in predicting snowfall is that whilst we know if it's going to snow, we have no real idea what type of snow is coming and how fast it's going to fall. High in the clouds, there are millions of tiny, supercooled water droplets. To make snow, first you need some of these droplets to evaporate into water vapour. This vapour then drifts through the cloud until it makes contact with something, maybe a speck of dust, or some other bit of matter that triggers the water vapour molecules into forming ice crystals. This process is called seeding. When ice crystals clump together, they can make a snowflake. But what scientists haven't been able to work out is just how much snow a cloud will produce. Now inside there is a piece of kit which is set to change that. This cylinder replicates the conditions needed to make snow. It can literally conjure a flurry of snow out of thin air. Well, technically, out of supercooled clouds. So Chris, this is a cloud chamber. This is where you make clouds here in the basement. So how does it actually work? It spans three floors of this building. And we make clouds using this giant kettle. The steam travels up this pipe into the 
uh, cloud chamber and condenses to form a cloud of supercooled water droplets. And then later on we can uh, nucleate this cloud, we can seed it and turn it into ice. They make this look simple, but don't be fooled. It's taken years of research to replicate what happens in nature high up in the atmosphere. So you actually just get straight snow out of the bottom like that. That is just, that's fantastic. And so that's fallen from the 10 metre height uh, from ice crystals and, and actually lands there snow. That's exactly it. But what is seeding exactly? And how does it create the ice crystals you need to make snow? We know that pure water freezes at zero degrees Celsius, but the water in these test tubes is 11 degrees below zero, and yet it's still liquid. For ice crystals to form, the supercooled water needs to latch onto something around which it can grow. In this case, it's a single ice crystal that triggers the chain reaction of lots more being able to form. Another more dramatic example uses a supercooled bubble of soapy water. When a tiny bit of ice hits it, crystals rapidly appear. But it's what happens to these tiny crystals after they form that determines if it's going to snow and how much snow will fall. Paul Connolly is working on what he hopes will be a new way to help predict snowfall more accurately. So these are the crystals being formed inside the cloud chamber. What are we actually looking at? So we're looking at the different ice crystals that have fallen out. And at this temperature, minus 15, you can see they're all the same uh, type of ice crystals. So they're all, they've all got the six-pointed shape. They're all hexagonal plates. But some of them, uh, more than one ice crystal stuck together, so you can see that one, there's two there. Right, so this is just two two crystals that have clumped together. That's right, yeah. And that's the beginning of the formation of a snowflake? Yeah, basically. So what actually determines whether a snowflake is going to fall? Put simply, it's to do with its weight and how much area it takes up. Because the area determines the air resistance. Some snowflakes have large surface area, not much mass, and fall very slowly. Some snowflakes are the opposite and fall much quicker. Right, I see. So this, this is how you work out what are the conditions in a cloud that determines whether it's going to snow or not. That's right, yeah. And it happens at different rates, at different temperatures. It's early days for this study. But it could lead to weather forecasters being able to accurately predict snowfall. And that could help prevent the kind of chaos that sees airports close and motorists stuck in snowdrifts. Last winter may have felt very long and very cold, but it wasn't the hardest winter that Britain has experienced in recent times. Some of you may remember 1963, the worst winter in living memory. The snow started on Boxing Day and the big freeze lasted until March. Thousands of miles of roads throughout Britain became impassable. Milk froze, water pipes cracked, and fresh water had to be rationed. Tanks were set up in the street, but even they froze up, and you needed hot water to thaw out the tap before you could get cold water to make hot water with. And the cause? Pretty much the same kind of Siberian weather that hit us last year. On December 21st, this Siberian anticyclone started to move in our direction. But the westerly Atlantic winds, which usually keep it at bay, suddenly weakened and the Siberian anticyclone moved right across to us. And by December 22nd, it had hit us. It was here and the big freeze had begun. And the second blow? Hundreds of towns and villages were cut off. For some, the only way to survive was to walk miles in the snow. Others had to be rescued. 
For over two months, the freezing air sat over the UK, a classic blocking pattern, but on an even bigger scale than our winter of 2010. And for 2011, well, people are already preparing for the worst, especially out in the countryside. Oh, that all good. We'll turn in. That was pretty impressive. <laughs> Not bad, through the gate first time. I've popped back home to Monmouthshire in South Wales to see what plans farmers are making to survive the worst that nature can throw at us, both for themselves and, of course, their livestock. Not far from here, I have a small holding, just over four acres, and I've got a couple of pigs, ten ewes, and some chickens and ducks and things. Now, when the hard weather hits, it is a bit of a nightmare. All the pipes freeze, the water troughs freeze, everything needs feeding twice as much as it does normally, and everything takes an awful lot more time. But imagine if you have a farm, several hundred acres, and your whole livelihood depends on the health of your livestock or the state of your fields. Then you really know the meaning of hard weather. This sheep farm is owned by friends of mine, Jim and Kate Bevan. The farm has been in the family for four generations. They have nearly a thousand sheep, 80 cows, and all sorts of other animals. Whatever the weather, these animals need feeding, and that's a big problem if their food is frozen under a foot of snow. If they are pregnant and they've got lambs inside them, then of course if they don't get enough food, then the lambs are going to suffer. And the other problem is when you're rooting around in the snow as a sheep and you're looking yeah. for food, you're using up energy. Right. And actually keeping warm in the, in the low temperatures, that's using up energy. So they need more food. So it's a bit of a vicious cycle. So you do go through an awful lot of food when the weather's cold. What have you done to kind of mitigate that? Oh, we've planted approximately 30 acres of root crops. Right. So they grow in sort of, there's a swift variety of kale which grows about that high. Yeah. Takes a lot of snow to cover that. Do you feel prepared? Do you think that if the worst happens, you can cope? Yep. We've had a good harvest this year, and like, we've got some good root crops. Food, I think we've got down to a tea. I think our biggest problem on this farm is water. I think water's going to be a problem, and, and at lambing time it's always a worry. Yeah. Because, you know, you think, well, should we lamb early, um, or should we lamb later? The snow might come in January, it might come in March, we get back to the crystal ball again. You just don't know when it's going to come. <laughs> Jim and Kate have been farming for a long time. As much as they will listen to the forecasts, they've learned the hard way that there's only so much a weather report can tell them. I can't see how it can work for months and months in advance. When they got a week of fortnight, yeah, I can see that, but uh, when they're saying, like, we're going to have heavy snow in January and February, I can't see it in my mind. I just can't seem to work out how they can do that. Short term, yeah. we've got it bang on now. I mean, today, I looked at it yesterday, but we knew exactly when the rain was going to start and when it was going to finish, and yeah. it was pretty much bang on. Cows were lying down. They said the cows were lying down, so we knew it was going to rain anyway. <laughs> but long term, um, as I remember, they said it was going to be a boiling hot summer, and, you know, we and didn't get it. What do you reckon, Jim? Is it going to snow this year? Yeah, we'll have snow, but... Uh, I don't think we're going to have the quantities that uh, people are saying. I honestly don't. I said three years on a trot now. Okay. I've got the sledges out. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you are. That is the definitive winter forecast from the Bevans. Of course, weather forecasting is hardly a new art. Gardener Alice Fowler has been tracking down some of the more eccentric methods of divining whether a freeze is on its way. Before modern weather forecasting, we looked to nature to tell us what to expect from the weather, not just day to day, but for weeks and months ahead. Bits of that knowledge, known as weather law, survive even today. 
We've all heard the saying, red sky at night, shepherd's delight, red sky in the morning, shepherd's warning. But is there any truth in it? It turns out there is. A red sky at night tells us that the setting sun is sending its light through dust particles. This usually means high pressure and stable air coming in from the west. So good weather is heading our way. If the morning sky is red, it can indicate lots of water in the atmosphere. And if it's cold enough, that can produce snow. But what about our big question? Will it snow? What weather law predicts harsh winters? This is one of my favourite ones. Onion skin very thin, miles of winter coming in. Onion skin thick and rough, coming winters cold and tough. Except for I think this is a Spanish one, so it's probably not that accurate. But of course, vegetables harvested in August simply cannot tell us anything about the winter ahead. So if onion weather law is out, what's in? They say that if the squirrel has a really bushy tail, then it's going to be a very cold winter. Hmm, surely it's just that they fluff up their tails to stay warm. Here's another. Thunder in September means snow is six weeks away. Also meaningless. So why did sayings like this come about? Most likely it's because trying to plan for bad weather was even more important to our ancestors than it is to us today. Lots of berries, particularly on the rowan or the holly, is always supposed to indicate that a hard winter is coming. And this has been a really good berry year. But alas, I haven't been able to find a scientist who can stand this one up for me either. Although I'm sure this berry bounty will be snapped up in weeks to come. But there is one piece of weather law that may be able to help us. Bob Elliott from the RSPB is the man in the know. What about that old wives' tale that the swan brings winter on its wings? Is that true? Well, I think it's a lovely, lovely saying, and uh, I think we've all grown up with that. But uh, perhaps there's an element of truth that they're actually fleeing the weather. They're, they're avoiding the colder weather. So, yes, they are, they are sort of bringing the, the winter with them. Is there a particular swan we should be looking out for? A very special species called the Buick swan, uh, nesting in Siberia. So they're all the summer they're up there, uh, rearing young. And in early November, there's a huge migration of these birds. Most of the wintering birds arrive all in one go over a couple of days. And very soon after that, we had some very snowy weather. So they were literally fleeing from these extreme weather conditions, this snow. So when the swan falls, the snow falls. Precisely. Well, it's the first week of November, and they haven't arrived yet, so I think we're okay for now. I'd like to believe that swans really can give us a heads up on the weather. But when the big freeze descends, it's the smaller birds that inhabit our gardens that need our help. So Bob's got some tips for us. What we try and do is recreate their natural food supplies in our gardens and it can be remarkably successful. So fruit for the fruit eating species like the thrushes and you know put out windfall apples. If you've got some spare rotten apples from the kitchen, put them outside on the ground. It could be really beneficial for them. And then do they need sort of more high protein food? I mean, an apple's just a lot of sugar really, isn't it? It is. Um, and they, they need seeds, they need high protein, they need fatty fatty foods. I mean, good old standard peanuts got lots of fat in it, which is why birds are attracted to peanut feeders and they really, really zone in on those. And they will know where they are. These feeding stations in people's gardens, these birds know where they are. It's in their territories, their, their winter territories, and they'll flock around and communally feed on them. So it's quite a special site, whereas birds in the summer they're all breeding, they're separate in their own territories. Okay. But here, in the winter, during snowy weather particularly, they're all gathered together. Competition is, is pretty fierce, but if there's enough food to go around, generally all these different species will be able to find their particular food needs. I sometimes put out warm water for the birds. Is this actually a good idea? It's a good idea. Um, obviously, that 
temperature's going to drop eventually, so it's overnight when that, when that will freeze. So why not try a, a, anything from a ping pong ball, or one of my friends has got loads of these, I don't know where from, these uh, yellow plastic ducks that you have in the bath, uh -huh. floating around on the, on the water bowl outside. It's a little bit breezy. The, the motion of those objects floating around will keep the ice from forming, at least enough for those birds early in the morning to, to, to drink. It's not just drinking though, it's, it's bathing that's incredibly yeah. important for them. Their feathers have to be absolutely in tip top condition to survive those, those really bad weather. They need to be insulated properly. They can only do that if they're clean. I can't quite imagine having a bath on a cold day, but I can see it makes sense. So there's lots we can do to help wildlife survive the snow. And we're helped by the fact that city gardens tend to be warmer. It's called the urban heat island effect. Gardens in big cities like London, Birmingham and Manchester can be as much as five degrees warmer than their rural counterparts. All that brick and concrete is great at stopping the heat escaping. But for prolonged cold spells, even our urban gardens fall victim to the weather. We just don't know what this winter will bring, but we do know from bitter experience how damaging it can be for the garden and the wildlife. So wrap up your plants, put out some extra bird food, and then if it does snow, at least you can just go out and enjoy it. This advice will help our wildlife through a tough winter, but what about us? Are the organisations that we rely on to keep us warm and healthy ready for the snow if it comes? It looks like our major utilities companies are already expecting the worst. Nearly a hundred major companies have had their gas supplies limited as the national grid tries to cope with the demand from homeowners, which is expected to have reached record levels today. The national grid has already been forced to issue a warning that demand for energy is threatening to outstrip supplies. Only the second time they've ever had to do so. When a cold snap bites, our demand for energy can jump 30% as we turn up the heating. It's not just about energy. Winter places an added burden on the NHS due to both floods and people injuring themselves on snow and ice. Yeah, I just slipped on the ice, I was out with my dog and uh, I had a stick with me and everything but uh, I just fell on the ice. Ice for us is always a nightmare because people fall over and break things, maybe we risk some ankles. A big freeze can cost the NHS an extra £42 million in treatment costs. The Met Office has arranged to send out extreme weather alerts direct to the NHS, all in a bid to help reduce the 25,000 extra deaths that are estimated if there's another big freeze. But it still feels as though these organisations are often working in the dark. So where are the newspapers getting their headlines from? There seem to be certain forecasters out there claiming they can offer long-range predictions. You can find them on the internet. But is it really possible to beat the Met Office? For big businesses, being able to plan weeks and months ahead is invaluable, and our supermarkets are no exception. When bad weather is predicted, we tend to bulk by. Hot chocolate is on the top of our list, and I'm delighted to say, so is birdseed. Now, supermarkets rely on the road and rail network to keep their shelves well stocked. But of course, when bad weather hits, that supply chain comes under threat. These days, most supermarkets have their own in-house weather analysts. That's how important it is to them to know what the weather's going to do. I went to find out more from Ross Eggleton at Morrison's. This is extraordinary, Ross. I think I've ever seen so much food in one place. It's a lot, isn't it? It is a lot. <laughs> Are you using the same weather forecasting as everyone else? Do you get all your information from the Met Office? We don't get it just from the Met Office. We also have uh, kind of like an independent um, provider that provides weather forecasts to us as a business. What do your customers tend to buy in the snow? 
when it snows, behaviour seems to um, shift. So it goes back into um, soups, porridges, cereals, water, uh, lots of tinned food. But in times of, um, you know, harsh weather, I think people like comfort. Yeah. So comfort. So it's sort of shepherd's pie, it's yeah. stews. It's, it's, it's the, the sort of the homemade, um, kind of more traditional British dishes. By combining Met Office data with information from other sources, this supermarket tries to stay ahead of the game. It's not foolproof, but Ross thinks it lets them get a slightly better handle on what's around the corner. Right, so what we've got here is this is um, basically a map um, yeah. of all of the areas serviced by the Bridgewater Depot. Right. And what we can do is we can pick up either an individual vehicle yeah. or we can look at a, a particular area. And what we get is we get a live feed back from that vehicle um, that tells us where it is in terms of its location, but it also tells us how fast it's moving and, more importantly, the distance it's travelled over the last four or five minutes. So each of these boxes, does that represent a vehicle? Yeah. Now, when it's snowing, what this enables us to do is we can see where our vehicles are getting impacted by either the weather or obviously by congestion due to the weather. Yeah. But using this tool last year, we were able to keep every store open every day. Really? Throughout the whole period. But presumably your nightmare scenario would be if you had a huge dump of snow immediately around where this depot is because that then stops everything going out. Absolutely, absolutely. Our, our worst case scenario is when uh, the snow falls heavy on a depot. Um, the risk to our business is just not you know, worth contemplating if we can't get out. Um, it's just not worth it. So the burning question, I suppose, Ross, is how nervous are you about this winter? What's your forecasters telling you? This year we think the pattern might be a bit different. We're expecting some heavy snow kind of the last week of November, right. but particularly in the northeast and Scotland. Um, there's going to be wintry showers in December throughout, we believe, um, but not to the same magnitude as last year. Uh, and we believe that the heavy snowfall is probably going to come in the new year. isn't it that there is a company that is willing to be that prescriptive about what the winter's weather has got in store not only saying that there's going to be a lot of snow in Scotland and the northeast at the end of this month but then prepared to say snow flurries throughout December and not until the new year Will there be a really serious snowfall in the UK? But I'm amazed that they feel that they can give that sort of very, very accurate information. Well, I'm, I'm with the Met Office on this. I'm pretty sceptical about being that precise about long-range forecasts. And let's be clear, the Met Office are not saying that it won't snow. What they're saying is we can't predict very accurately on what day it's going to snow. But there are these websites, aren't there, that are kind of filling a gap. I suppose, you know, we do want and kind of expect very accurate weather forecasts. That's right, that's right. I mean, pe people really do want to know this information because of our national obsession with the, with the weather may be. But I don't, think, I don't think the science is good enough to make those specific predictions. If we, if we, we, we can actually, you know, put our postcode into this one here. So, um, gee, oh, uh, so it's a postcode for Scotland, BBC Scotland, yeah. Right, and what does it say? Uh, 13 to 14 degrees in the next few days, and the chances of snow are... Zero. Zero. No real surprise there. That's but good that's science. five days. Right. And, so, and that, you think, scientifically stands up? I think meteorologists around the world would agree with that. That's what weathermen do. Yeah. What I would be extremely cautious about is saying it's going to snow in six weeks' time, or on the 17th of December, or on a very specific long-range forecast. And those specific long-range forecasts have got us into trouble in the past. It reminds me of the infamous summer of 2009. The economy may be in the doldrums, but at least there's some hope on the horizon for a long, hot summer. The Met Office says we're heading for what it terms a prolonged period of barbecue weather this year. And after the washouts of recent years, it could well be a summer to remember. It didn't just rain a bit, it poured and poured. I think it'd be better to be home because it's getting very, very, very wet. And the weather got even more extreme. 
out in the Bristol Channel, cameras spotted what looked like a winter spout, while the Isle of Lewis was hit by a tornado. So did the Met Office get it wrong, or were they misinterpreted? I'm going to take you back to the summer of 2009, the infamous summer where we were promised barbecues from beginning to end, and actually all that happened was that it rained, it was pretty cold, and our barbecues sat in the garden getting rusty. Why did you get it so wrong? I think the message got sort of translated by certain sections of the press into what's called a deterministic forecast. It will be a hot summer. The actual press releases and information that we put out said it's odds on for a barbecue summer, and the probability was quite high that we would end up perhaps with a warmer than average summer. As it turned out, believe it or not, the, the summer wasn't quite as bad as you think. But nonetheless, yes, it was a bit of a disappointment for many people. This is the problem with any kind of forecast. The weather around us is just too chaotic for anyone to be able to make a definitive prediction more than a few days ahead. And maybe there's another side to this, that the public doesn't always take the weather as seriously as it should. This is the M8 motorway, the busiest in Scotland, brought to a standstill by the worst blizzard to hit the country in 40 years. Hundreds of motorists were left stranded. With no let up in the conditions, many were forced to spend the night in their cars as temperatures plunged to minus 14 degrees centigrade. Well, I started the deer park at five past ten this morning. And that's me, I've just what, played an average of five mile in 12 hours nearly. Somebody needs to pay for this. The head of transport, the transport minister. The Met Office warned of severe blizzards and icy roads a full 12 hours before the snow arrived. As a new weather feature brings fresh snowfall into the central belt just in time for the rush hour. Despite the warning, motorists headed off to work and drove straight into a clearly forecast blizzard. However much warning we get, there's little we can do to keep our roads clear when a blizzard on this scale hits. So what about this year? Well, if our last couple of winters are anything to go by, it's a problem that's not just confined to Scotland. If major roads anywhere in the country aren't treated in time, then it's gridlock. So have we learned a valuable lesson? Apparently, we now have 1,500 extra tonnes of grit stockpiled up and down the country. But is there really enough to go around? Now, it might not look like much, but this time last year, this stuff was like gold dust. UK stockpiles of grit ran dangerously low, and some councils ran out altogether. There were even reports of criminal gangs stealing this stuff and selling it on a black market. So the question is, this time round, are we better prepared? I've come to one of three depots that supply Glasgow's fleet of gritters. I'm hoping that Robert Booth, the council's executive director of land and environmental services, will convince me this time we'll be prepared. Right, Robert, I'm pretty sure this is the biggest pile of grit I've ever stood on. How much have we got here? Well, we've got 6,000 tonnes in this barn and we've got 22,000 tonnes held in Glasgow. So the, the, the simplest question I can ask is, well, what is it? Well, that's a mixture of rock salt and molasses or sugar. So this is salt with sugar on it. Mm. That seems like quite a complex thing for grit. I mean, most people just think it's dirt. That mixture allows us to melt ice and snow down as low as minus 10 degrees, whereas rock salt was on, on would stop working at temperatures of around minus 6 degrees. So it actually gives us a material that's better in combating the severe weather that we can get up here in Scotland and elsewhere. And so, where'd you get it from? Well, most of our stock comes from Northern Ireland, um, but we have had in the past purchased from as far away as Chile. So this is this is Irish grit, most of it, yes. And that over there, Chilean grit. Most of that, yes. <laughs> yes. 
It's estimated that upwards of 50,000 tons per day would be needed to keep Britain moving through another big freeze. But it's not just having reserves of grit that's important. You also have to know where and when to use it. Right, so your man's loading up the gritter from the 6,000 tonnes then. When do you know the right time to grit? Not when you have to us. We've got three weather forecasts each day. One in the morning, one at noon, one at 7 p.m. at night. We also have a series of sensors in the roads across the city. All those factors allow our supervisors to make a decision of when we have to grit. And we try to grit before the weather hits the city. Get the grit down in the roads before the snow comes. Temperature sensors in the road can give an indication of where and when the grit is most needed. But that level of preparedness isn't cheap. It cost us last year £4 million pounds for our winter maintenance programme. And that's a lot of money, but it's a small price to pay to ensure Blazer continues to operate. And this sentiment is echoed across the country, with the vast majority of councils ordering much more grit than in 2010. And with luck, that will be enough to avoid the chaos of last year. Well, since then, the great <laughs> British grit off. <laughs> it's demonstration time. Clearly it is. OK, so you demonstrate why grit is so important for getting us through the winter. Right, well, here is a giant bucket of grit. Yeah. Which I may or may not have borrowed off Glasgow Council. <laughs> <laughs> this is the stuff that's in those yellow bins that you see along the side of the road. That's it? right. Now, yeah. this, this one has quite a lot of rocks in it, but basically grit is rock salt. Okay. So it's salt. Yeah. This is a big block of ice. No. <laughs> yeah. You're good, aren't you? I can see why you're a scientist. I know. I know. So, what happens is... When you mix salt with water, it mm. reduces the freezing temperature. So if I put salt on water, it will no longer freeze at zero degrees. So it pops on down on there. Yeah, what, just sprinkle it on the top there. Yeah. Oh, look, it's melting already. Now, the thing is that ice has a, has a particular characteristic, which is sort of unique, but it's what makes grit work in terms of gritting the road. Shh, shh, shh. I'm going to do something. I'm just going to lean my microphone over this. Can you hear it all cracking? It is melting. It is melting. Yeah, sorry, go on. So, right, when you put your hand on, on ice, yeah. right, it feels sidey. And the reason for that is that ice is not just solid. On the surface, it has a constantly changing uh, melting and refreezing cycle okay. all the time. Yeah. And that is why ice skaters can glide so easily, because there's a thin sheen of water. Yeah. Right. Now, what happens is when you add the salt yeah. in the form of grit yeah. to the ice, yeah. it dissolves into that surface layer right. and stops it from refreezing. So what you've got then is water rather than ice, and that's much safer for driving or walking on. Exactly, because the tyres can just go over it rather than sliding over that thin surface. Okay, but there was a conundrum last year, particularly here in Scotland, where it got so cold, people were claiming that grit no longer worked. That is also true. And the reason for that is that when you get to about minus 7 to 9 degrees Celsius, mm. the salt doesn't dissolve into the water because it freezes too quickly. So at that point, grit stops working, and that's why there was a crisis. At that point, you just got to use sand or not go out. At all. Probably best. But, 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 mm. there is another thing. Actually, it isn't just specific to salt. You can use anything that will dissolve in water. It has the effect of reducing the freezing temperature of that water. And as we've seen, even sugar can do the job. Although last winter, there were reports of sheep licking the sugary grit off the roads. So, OK, Humble? Yeah? Keep your sheep inside if you're using sugary grit. I absolutely will. <laughs> Thank you. That was a splendid demonstration. However much we love to moan, are our winters really getting worse? Well, science would argue that, in fact, we shouldn't be moaning at all. We know from studying ice core samples that there was a time when our winters were very different. For a period of almost 300 years, from 1550 to 1850, the average temperature in Britain fell by half a degree. 
Now that doesn't sound a lot, but it had a devastating effect on our climate. This period is known as the Little Ice Age. It caused the River Thames to freeze over. Bitter winters reduced the growing season for farmers by as much as two months. Crops failed, forcing up grain prices. The result was malnutrition and famine, which wiped out huge numbers of the population. Bitterly cold winters had become a fact of life. But since then, when you look over the long term, it looks like our average temperatures have climbed significantly. Despite our last three cold winters, when we look back at snowfall records for the last century, we see that a snowy winter is now actually quite a rare event in the British Isles. But if it's not the start of another mini ice age, what is it? So could three bad winters in a row simply be a freak of nature, or is there something else out there that's having a profound influence on our weather? The sun, our nearest star, it heats our planet, but can it be responsible for freezing Britain? And if so, what is it about the sun's activity that cools rather than warms the UK? You'd be forgiven for thinking that the sun might not be the first thing that you take into consideration when trying to predict snowfall. But scientists here at the University of Reading have established a clear link between sunspot activity and our winter weather. Sunspots are dark regions on the surface of the sun. They're caused by intense magnetic activity. When they disappear, Less heat and light hit the Earth, which the team at Reading believes shows up as a reduction in levels of ultraviolet light. They think fewer sunspots and less UV light means harsher winters. Mike Lockwood is at the forefront of this research. So the sun's nice and warm today, but how can the sun actually make our weather colder it seems very counterintuitive what it does is it affects the very most the highest part of the atmosphere the stratosphere how those winds propagate down into the lower atmosphere where our weather and climate are is actually not easy to understand but we're beginning to think it does right so it's actually the effect of the of the sun the uv from the sun on the stratosphere which determines what happens down on the ground for Europe, yes, this isn't a global phenomenon. It's something that affects Europe, and in particular Eastern Europe, and, and here we're on the edges of that in the UK. Mike and his colleagues are using data from satellites that measure ultraviolet light from the sun. They've detected a reduction in UV levels and think that this is a result of the solar cycle. The most well-known cycle of the sun is roughly 11 years. It goes from being very quiet to very active and back again on an 11-year cycle. So what is the sun doing right now? What point in the cycle is it today? We've just emerged from the longest and lowest solar minimum that we've had since about 1920. So right now, they think we have fewer sunspots and less UV light hitting the Earth. And in turn, they're modelling how these changes affect the Earth's stratosphere, which could change the weather systems that we experience down on the ground. What we've found is that when solar activity is unusually low, as it has been recently, the jet stream can form these big meanders and that can influence the weather underneath and that affects, in particular in winter, it affects us here. Ultimate irony, in a globally warming world, Europe may get more cold winters. And they think it's the northern hemisphere that's especially vulnerable and that low solar activity could be one of the factors that causes the jet stream to behave unusually. Remember blocking that big bad weather wolf? 
Mike's colleague, Dr. Tim Willings, is working on what causes blocking and how quickly it can happen. A blocking event um, is basically a, um, a type of weather pattern that's fairly persistent, so we'll have the weather pattern sticking around for a whole week or two. So, so here we go, this is the blocking forming with the air being pulled up from the tropics up over Greenland. Oh, I see. So, so this, this, this dense dark blue bit here is cold air from the Arctic. Exactly, yeah. And it's yeah. being pulled down. Exactly, that's right, yeah. So these events are, are, are pretty persistent for weather patterns. Uh, so once it's actually started, uh, then, then yes, in a sense, we have quite a bit of predictability for the next week or two. But you don't know but when the, they're going to start. The key is when they're going to start, yeah. yeah Got it. Yeah, yeah, it yeah, does yeah. look very... Ca I'm, I'm not, I'm not no, jealous no, no. Of, of you trying to solve these problems because it, it looks insanely chaotic to me. It looks like you can't actually predict. Um, well, this is it. I mean, it's amazing that weather prediction works at all. It's amazing that you can predict the weather a few days or, or even a week in advance. The idea is still the subject of much discussion, and tantalising though it is, it's likely to be a few years yet before this theory is fully understood. Predicting the weather is fiendishly difficult because there are so many complex and chaotic factors involved. But when scientists look at the bigger picture, including solar activity, they can get a much more detailed understanding of how local weather works. And ultimately, that means better, more accurate snow forecasting. Now, I know that there are very few of you sitting at home watching this thinking, please, let's have another long, hard, cold winter, but you can't deny it. There is something very romantic about a white Christmas, isn't there? Everybody loves a white Christmas. I think Bing Crosby is largely responsible for And Charles that. Dickens, it has to be said. And Dickens. Yeah. So the last official white Christmas was mm. in 2009. Right. But get this, the official criteria for what constitutes a white Christmas mm. are that a single snowflake has to fall... It doesn't even have to land. That cannot be true. Surely your perfect white Christmas is piles of mince pies, loads of snow everywhere, singing robins, you know, that's... No. Alas, not. And it's, it gets even more ridiculous than that because there are nine specific locations right. where a white Christmas can be officially... You can't remember them, can you? That's why you need to look up on your phone. Well, how about this? Cool. Aberdeen Football Club. Right. So hang on. Just get me this right. <laughs> if one snowflake falls above Aberdeen Football Club, it is a white Christmas. It has to be observed. Yeah. Uh, Belfast Airport. Yeah. Birmingham Bullring, which I think is a shopping centre. Yeah. Cardiff, the Millennium Stadium. Yeah. Edinburgh Castle. Glasgow Cathedral, just over there. Right. Uh, Liverpool, the Albert Dock, Buckingham Palace, of course, Obviously. so if the Queen sees one She's coming down. She's going to be standing there all day on Christmas Day. <laughs> Manchester, it's Granada Studios, and the, the next one is my back garden. <laughs> no, I made that one up. So, so, so if a snowflake is observed in the sky, doesn't even have to fall, doesn't even have to settle over any of those locations... It's a white Christmas. It's officially a white Christmas. It's a rubbish white Christmas. Yeah. I'm sorry. Are the odds in yet? In London, it's currently about 10 to 1. 10 to 1 yeah. that it's going to be a white Christmas. In yeah. Glasgow, it's, it's about 7 to 1. Is it? There is a bet which I'm not going to make. Are you not? <laughs> it's ludicrous. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying what? Do you think it's going to snow? Do you think it's going to be a white Christmas? Uh, no, it's definitely not. <laughs> Look at him, he's a scientist and he's hedging his bets. Scientists Can don't make you bets. you believe it? If I knew it was going to snow, then yeah. I'd make a bet. That's what science does. See, it's pathetic. Well, let's just remind ourselves of what our experts have told us. It's going to snow somewhere in the British Isles this winter, but anyone who turns around and says on the 25th of December, which happens to be Christmas Day, it will snow, is quite frankly a fool. We're expecting some heavy snow kind of the last week of November, right. but particularly in the northeast and Scotland. Will it snow this winter? Well, you'll have to talk to the metaphors about that and then see what their latest predictions are. Being able to pinpoint the precise conditions under which snow forms in the atmosphere could soon offer help to forecasters when it comes to predicting when a monster snowfall will hit. But at the moment, long-range predictions can only ever give us a broad picture of the type of conditions we can expect in any given winter. 
They can't tell us categorically when or even if it will snow. The good news is that meteorologists can recognize the kind of weather system that brings very cold conditions, one that blocks the warming effects of currents like the jet stream and the thermohaline circulation, which keep the UK mild. However, it is a system that can close in on us in a matter of days, so it's not something that will be picked up by long-range forecasts. As for the mini ice age, the expert consensus is that there's simply no compelling evidence. In fact, some argue we may even be in for a run of milder winters. So we may not know where or when it's going to snow, but we do know that it will snow. And I think the quite heartening thing that we've discovered on our epic weather quest around the country is that people are beginning to take the idea of winter much more seriously. And organisations like our supermarkets and the health service and airports are getting prepared for the worst. So that if it does happen, we shouldn't get into the pickle that we did last winter. That's right, and it's the beginning of November right now, and all the best data we can get from the Met Office suggests that we are not going to have a particularly cold winter. But what we have learned is that the position of the UK on the Earth means that our weather systems are chaotic and difficult to predict, so we can't rule out the possibility that we may get a sudden big freeze. Yes, don't shout at the weatherman if it happens. And also remember that we are standing here at the beginning of November. That is the beginning of winter, a season where temperatures drop and occasional bad weather does get flung at our doorsteps. So here's my little piece of advice for what it's worth. Dig out your winter woolies, stock up on hot chocolates and bird feed and get out and really enjoy what is a fantastically exciting season. And get your sledge ready. Yeah, get your sledge ready because you never know, Adam Rutherford, it just might snow. <laughs> You can make it snow. Tomorrow night, Panorama asks, what's fueling your energy bill? That's over on BBC One at half past eight. Next tonight, though, footy highlights from Match of the Day.